Good evening, everyone. Um, this is the Northampton Board of Health. It's uh, October 17th. But before we formally open our meeting, um, I'd like to invite anyone who would like to make a public comment to raise your electronic hand. I believe it's under the react button. Uh, we can't see you, so you can't wave at us. Um, but um, anyone who would like to make a comment uh, would have two minutes to speak. Uh, Suzanne, would you do the pleasure of being our timer? Sure. Thank you. Um, is there anyone here for public comment? I'm sorry, I can't figure out my uh, re my React is not letting me raise my hand, but I would like to be part of public comment. Are uh, you talking about Heather Warner? Is that, that yes. who's speaking? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you are on, go ahead. Um, hi, good evening. Thank you for um, talking about the tobacco regulations tonight. Um, I know that one of the things that's um, being considered is a ban on uh, the oral pouches. And I just wanted to uh, see, I'll just back up a little bit and I'll just restate. I'm Heather Warner, uh, she, her pronouns. And I am. Um, I work at the Collaborative for Educational Services as the Hampshire Franklin Tobacco Free Community Partnership Coordinator. Um, I uh, feel that the nicotine pouches are sort of the newest um, attempt by the industry to follow up on, you know, Juul, which um, when there was a declining uh, combustion smoking uh, trend, um, they pushed very hard to get um, vaping in place and their target audience was clearly young people. I feel like Zinn is doing a similar thing. Um, Zinn is one of the brand names of On and Zalo and other pouches. And in 2016, they were bought out by uh, Philip Morris, who then started marketing them more directly to young people <laughs> using social media. Um, the Zinn pouches, some might say, are uh, a falsely claim that they're a cessation device. They, the um, concentration in Zinn uh, can be as low as four milligrams of um, nicotine, but we have seen them as high as 28 or even in the 30s per pouch, which is a kind of outrageous and almost toxic amount of nicotine um, to be delivered and certainly wouldn't be um, the type of milligrams you would want for cessation. In fact, it does the opposite and can create addiction much more quickly. Um, these products also claim to be um, flavor free, but uh, in San Francisco and Washington DC, there are lawsuits claiming that they violate the flavor laws that they have in place because in fact, they do have um, a smell and a taste that qualifies as a flavor. Um, we're seeing, you may also hear that the rates of Zin use among young people are low, but we are seeing that these are climbing rapidly, doubling each year. Um, and in fact, although the national rates um, still are around 1.8% in Mass, in uh, Hampshire County, among 12th graders, it, the rate was 4.5% in 2023. That's two um, minutes, Joanne. If you want two minutes, that's two minutes. Yeah, you can have another. Did you, you, did you, say, your, did you say two or three minutes? Two, but Thank Heather, you. go ahead and finish your thought. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and so that survey data is based on the Spiffy survey of over 2,200 students in 2023. Um, yeah, so just uh, the, the we're hearing in the community from schools, from coalitions, that this is actually an increasing and large problem among young people. So I, I hope that you will consider these thoughts when you're passing this regulation. Thank you. Um, Jeff Smith. Good evening, folks. Um, how, are you, how are you doing today? OK. Hey, can you hear okay. me all right? Uh, you're a little quiet. I'm sorry. I'll try to get closer to the mic. Is that better? Yes, better. Right, yeah. great. So I am a, I'm a neuroscientist by training, but my current role is at R Street Institute, which is a nonprofit, nonpartisan public policy research organization. 
And our mission is to engage in policy research and outreach to promote free markets and limited effective governments in many areas, including the area of tobacco harm reduction. And that's really the purpose of, of, call, of, of, of speaking today. Um, I, 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 I always give the every local authority and in, in communities the freedom to, to make whatever decisions are best for the community. But we, we, I want to make sure that the science is, is understood and, and heard, heard so that can inform your decision in a manner that is, uh, is, is uh, the best for all in your community. Um, we really don't feel that the evidence is present to move nicotine pouches out from behind a gas uh, station and convenience store registers, um, simply because um, the youth uh, use is very low. Um, the evidence in terms of the scientific evidence related to the potential risk of these products is extraordinary low, and really at the same level as what you would see with a nicotine patch. Um, it's true that it's not an FDA approved cessation product, but it is a product that's used by individuals that smoke in order to transition to a smoke-free life. And to take that opportunity away from them when they fill up their car, go into the store, get a Snickers, and they see the wall of cigarettes behind the register and there's no other options, it's so easy for them to um, to, to, to simply give in and buy a pack of cigarettes instead of going for the uh, product that can help them transition to a, to a, to a smoke-free life. I, too, is, am very concerned about youth access for any nicotine product or any alcohol product or any product that could have any potential health on a young uh, uh, health impacts on a young person's uh, uh, brain and body. Uh, but I'm also very certain that uh, most communities have extraordinarily well-prepared retailers. That's two. Mm -hmm. You can finish that, that. Thank you. That do their job very well in terms of ensuring that underage individuals don't get access to alcohol, lottery tickets, or it's tobacco products as well. So I encourage you guys to uh, allow for these products to be continue to be sold uh, in uh, storefronts other than just adult only storefronts and, and allow your consumers access to the products that will help improve their health. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone else here for public comment? I don't see any hands. Um, okay, I think we'll move on. Um, all right, we will convene the official Board of Health uh, meeting. Would anyone like to make a motion? to open the meeting yes um is there a second second any discussion all in favor cynthia yes suzanne yes janet yes joanne yes um so this is the official northampton board of health meeting it's october 17th it's 5 43 p.m um today for board members we have myself Dr. Joanne Levin, we have Dr. Cynthia Suopis, we have Janet Grant and Dr. Suzanne Smith. Um, we have um, one open position on the board currently. Um, um, Meredith, uh, would you like to introduce yourself and your staff and visitors? Absolutely, thank you. Um, I'm Meredith O'Leary. I am the City of Northampton Department of Health and Human Resources Health Commissioner. And with us today, we have Director of Environmental Health, Amy Hutchins. We have one of our public health nurses here, Jennifer, and I call her Jennifer D. Um, Dinko, Dink. <laughs> help me, Jen D. <laughs> You're on mute. Dinkowitz. No? Yes, thank you. All right, thank you. And then we have our public health technology program manager, Molly Jackson Watts with us today. We have our department um, administration assistant and that's Kelly Constantine. And then I also see one of our inspectors, Donna Bowman with us today. And that is it for the DHHS staff. Great, and we have a guest. 
So first I would like um, Molly Jackson Watts to unmute herself and introduce herself. Molly started with the DHHS. I wanna say early in August. Um, so she's gonna talk a little bit about her background and then her current position. Thank you, Molly, for coming. Thanks, Meredith. Uh... Good evening, everybody. Nice to see you all. Um, I think I've worked with quite a few of you in past iterations of life. Um, so it's nice to see you again. Um, so my new position um, here in Northampton, Meredith's correct, I started at the beginning of August. And um, my role is to play um, program manager for technology projects. And what um, the way I am seeing that and the way that seems to be playing out is um, kind of being the strategic project manager and finding um, the ways that we use technology with both internally and in external partnerships um, within the department to make things um, function better, to track the work that we're doing more, to help things flow. Um, sure, you all know um, Melissa Aloisi, and I work in tandem with her. She is um, the more technical nitty gritty of the two of us, and I'm the one who will be doing more of um, working throughout the department, talking to people about the work that they're doing, figuring out how we can both track the work that we're doing better or um, customized software, customized technology to help support the work of the department more. Um, so for example, I've been working quite a bit so far with the DCC, looking at how they're tracking participants in, um, in the program, um, looking at how we can improve that and also then helping take that information and turn it into some good, useful reporting, both for grants and also looking at um, strategically um, how, where we might see opportunities for adjustment or grant applications um, to uh, continue on the great work that's being done there. Um, and I'd be kind of doing that amongst all of the different divisions over time um, in the various ways that are supportive. Um, so I come to Northampton um, from uh, many years working at the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and my role there was um, the manager of data education and municipal technology. So um, through that work, I really managed all kinds of data projects, data analysis, and supporting cities and towns in using technology to um, serve the public and also just to have um, kind of better ongoing support in their operations. Um, so I think there's a lot of work that I did previously that I'm excited to be bringing into the team here. Um, one of the um, main ways that I got connected with the city and with this department in particular was facilitating um, a regional opioid data collaborative with Michelle and Cherry and Melissa and, and um and then throughout western massachusetts um so i'm very familiar with a lot of the um uh, the work in that that regard and excited to be a part of the team and i just want to say uh truly it has been an amazing start working in this department meredith and michelle are just such wonderful enthusiastic supportive leaders um just it's just a great energy in the department. Um, they, they foster collaboration, they foster communication, and I'm just, I'm really excited to be here. Fabulous, welcome. Thank you, Molly. And Thank our you. team is truly blessed to have you on our team. Mm -hmm. um, when I even, um, when, when Molly and I even started having conversations about the possibility of her coming, I did everything in my power to get her here. Like I really, you know, having had the experience of working with her, you know, on, uh, in, in, on larger projects, just watching from the outside in, I was knew of her, I, I knew very well of her capabilities, her capacities, how she works, and um, I knew I wanted her to be part of this team. And she is truly an asset. And it's only been three months, and I, the what she's done for us is just incredible. So, 
we look forward to many, many, many years working together. So thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, you have something to share with us? Hi, yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jen Denkevitz. I've been with the DHHS since February. I am part of the public health nursing team. There's four of us in our team. And uh, yes, I'd like to give you a brief update on, I'll start with respiratory disease and progress to other things uh, in Massachusetts and here in Northampton. Uh, COVID cases and COVID deaths are very low right now and continue to decrease across the state. Since the beginning of July uh, last week um, in Massachusetts had the lowest numbers in reported cases. There were 1,672 cases compared to a high in mid-August, which was 3,261. Uh, RSV and flu are low to minimal as well, um, but we know that respiratory season is on its way, so we're gonna be continuing to watch the numbers. Uh, wastewater in Massachusetts has been trending down after a peak in September, but right now there is a slight rise. In Northampton, wastewater is lowest um, that it's been since Jan July and trending down. Uh, I'd like to give you an update on our vaccine clinics and homebound visits. Uh, since September 1st, the DHS HS has vaccinated at 19 sites, including some outreach sites at uh, Northampton Housing and Regional Clinics. We've given approximately 1,250 vaccines. Uh, of that, 652 are flu, 568 are COVID, and there is at least 21 more clinics scheduled, including um, our Boot of the Flu on 1026 from 9 to 1 and our Elks Clinic on 1114. Uh, people can sign up on the DHHS website and I wanted to give out a special thanks to our vaccinators that volunteer their time to make these clinics happen. Without them, it would be rough. Um, our whole bound program right now, we have vaccinated 20 folks, 11 of them with high dose flu, and the towns that are being served are Northampton, Granby, Hatfield, West, Hat West Hatfield, and Southampton. Um, as far as uh, this year, North Northampton vaccination rates compared to last, uh, as far as COVID goes, um, uh, flu uptake is less at this point at 42% and compared to last year's 45% at this time. And our COVID last season was 22%, but we just don't have the numbers that I can you know, give out to you at this, this moment. Um, I want to give you a quick update on our childhood vaccine program. We vaccinate students who are under-resourced and it's very satisfying to give them a vaccine and connect them with this service. We're working with the schools to try to get all these kiddos vaccinated. Uh, overall, our, uh, the childhood vaccine rates for routine vaccinations nationally has gotten worse. Um, the exemption rates are increasing. In Hampshire County, childhood um, exemption rate is 2.4, and in Northampton, it's um, reported at 3%. Uh, this week, uh, I had the pleasure of working with my coworker, M and I assisted uh, Mass Department of Public Health, and they reached out for assistance vaccinating some pediatric new arrivals that live in town. So on Tuesday, we worked with, in collaboration with John Snow Inc. and Cataldo Ambulance Service vaccinating some kiddos. I think there may have been about roughly 35 was the numbers. And we provided assistance with, uh, you know, logistic assistance with workflow. And um, that included some translation services, uh, reviewing historical records and administering vaccines. Uh, our public health nurses uh, continue to visit local councils of aging, and we provide BP clinics and educational pre presentations uh, with some public health nurse topics. Uh, a year ago, uh, there was only one town enrolled in our monthly PHN visits, and cur currently we are providing uh, services on a monthly basis to six towns. 
uh, in addition to Northampton, that is. Uh, we also are conducting weekly visits to the Northampton Senior Center and five Northampton Housing Authority uh, properties. And they are, uh, the, the properties are attended on a rotating weekly schedule. Some of our re recent health topics are mosquito, tick-borne tick illnesses, foot care education, foodborne illnesses, and today M and I were at the Senior Center presenting on health advocacy, which we had a great turnout and some very thoughtful discussion. Uh, we have services requests uh, underway for two more communities that would be new, that would be Cummington and Granby. And um, us public health nurses have been participating in the DCC space, providing education. Uh, we put up a, a new educational topic every two weeks on a whiteboard. Um, uh, some of our past topics over this, the f past few months have been West Nile virus and triple E, adulterants in the local drug supply uh, that increase uh, overdose risk, and we had a great one last week for STI Jeopardy. And the responders provided that the mm -hmm. feedback was very engaging for the participants, sparked conversation and created valuable opportunities for learning. Uh, quick infectious up uh, disease update. We um, do have an uptick of pertussis cases. Thankfully, no seriousness in illness and no deaths. Um, I would like to uh, thank everybody for this opportunity to speak tonight. And I really would like to praise my coworkers at the DHHS team for all their hard work and um, thoughtfulness uh, serving our community members. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jen. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? Jen, I do. Uh, that was wonderful. Um, I know that, you know, we talked a little bit before you came on tonight and you did a really good job. I love how you Thanks. incorporated more of the public health nursing offerings that we provide to our community and to the region. So thank you very much. Yeah, and I would I would like to, like I said, my team has been so helpful with all of this. We work really well together and discuss important topics, and I want to shout out to them as well. So thank you. We hope to see more of you. Mm -hmm. You will. <laughs> <laughs> have a, have yeah. a great meeting. Thank you very yeah. much. Have a great night, Jen. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Yep. All right. Uh, next up is a continuation of our hearing. Are those folks here? I'm here. I'm the attorney for the uh, for the store. Kyle, is uh, is everyone here that's supposed to be here um, for you? Because we are six minutes early for the scheduled hearing. Um, I'm. I would like. To, can I just give my client a call? I just want to make see if he's hopping on or not. Because I know we are a few minutes early, and he was told yeah. six. Absolutely. We'll mind. go to the reviewing the minutes. We could do Thank something you. else. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um. Okay, you want to go to minutes? Yeah. Okay. Um, we have some minutes from September 19th. I don't know if everyone got a chance to look at them. I did make some minor edits, but I don't see them. Um, does everyone have a chance to look at the minutes? I looked at them. Just scan them. Any questions or comments? Looking at them now. Don't have any initial comments? Would anyone like to make a motion? Move to approve the minutes from the September meeting. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you. Any questions or comments? All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. 
Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Minutes are approved. Okay. All right, it's 5.59. Uh, we can proceed. Um, he's working, but I, he says I can give him a ring if there's any specific questions that the board may need answers on. Okay, so he doesn't want to be present. Uh, he, he's, he's at the store, so he can't. He doesn't want to be on Zoom if customers come in. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, all right. Um, would someone like to make a motion to open the um, hearing? This is a hearing um, for, hold on, let me get the details. Um, oops. This is a continuation of a hearing for a tobacco violation of the city of Northampton board of health restricting the sales of tobacco products and electronic nicotine delivery systems regulation and the state of Massachusetts minimum standards for retail sale of tobacco and electronic nicotine delivery systems 105 CMR 665 racing mart fuels would someone like to open. Um, the meeting. Move to open the hearing. Is there a second. I'll Thank second. you. Any questions or comments. All in favor, Suzanne? Yes. Cynthia? Yes. Janet? Uh, Joanne, yes. The hearing is now open. Um, so it's October 17th, it's 6.01 p.m. Um, and the ground rules for this hearing is that uh, no one may speak without being recognized by the chair. Uh, testimony can only be related to the issue at hand. Evidence may consist of oral testimony, documents, photographs, videos, models, and other means of conveying information. Time will be limited. Only evidence related to the issues before the board will be accepted. Irrelevant, immaterial, and information based on speculation and emotion are not appropriate evidence. Um, the rules of evidence that apply in a court do not apply in a public hearing of local boards, committees, or commissions. As such, hearsay and other evidence that would not be permitted in a court may be heard by the board, committee, or commission and accorded such weight as appropriate. Um, and so present we have Mr. Kyle Vieira, is that, did I pronounce your name correctly? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay, and you are representing? Yep, Fuel Marts. Fuel Marts. And the owner's name again, please. Uh, Rakesh Patel. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a continuation of that previous hearing. Uh, last time we did hear evidence and a request was made to continue uh, because the lawyer had just come on board and didn't have all the information. Um, does anybody want to hear the evidence again? How do you want to proceed? Oh. Donna, would you be willing to maybe uh, summarize? This is a, this is a uh, serious uh, decision that we're making um, for, for, uh, with impact on this particular business. So I would like mm -hmm. to make sure that we're all fully informed. Yep. Good evening, everyone. Hi, Donna. Thank you for being here. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, just a quick summary um, of how we got here tonight. Um, uh, it started uh, the first uh, violation we had uh, uh, back on 1 uh, uh, January 3rd of 2023 uh, was the first violation fine from the board of $1,000. And that consisted of uh, sell, uh, missing signage, selling flavored tobacco, selling menthol items, uh, selling uh, uh, e-cigarettes over the 35 milligrams, um, no manufacturer letters, uh, and other things, state, uh, Delta 8 products, things like that. Um, there was no stacking at that time. We just went with, they, there were multiple violations, but uh, we just fined on one. Um, 
uh, on 814 of 23 uh, was their second and third violations, which were stacked. Uh, again, selling flavored e-cigarettes, um, selling and, and also selling uh, e-cigarettes over the 35 milligrams again. At that point, there was a $2,000 fine for the second violation and a $5,000 fine for the third violation. On uh, 812 of 24, we received a complaint from a, um, a minor's uh, parent regarding uh, sale of flavored products out of the store to their youth. Uh, we went over and did an inspection on 8 13, 24 and found that the store was indeed selling uh, flavored uh, blunt wraps, flavored uh, cigarettes, um, flavored uh, in, uh, tobacco enhancers, blunt wraps, uh, and again, no manufacturer letters. Uh, we did speak with the owner at the time via Zoom to let him know what we had found. Uh, uh, and at that point, uh, the permit was suspended uh, as of uh, as of the the, the thirteenth. We uh, we went to the hearing. Uh, in the meantime, had another uh, another uh, follow up visit, um, and found that they were again selling e flavored cigarettes out of a storage bin on the counter, uh, and also out of a, a backpack um, behind the counter. What was the date of that? That was uh, eight uh, nine five. 24. That was before the hearing. Mm -hmm, correct. Donna, were the fines paid? Yes, they were. Have there been any visits since our last board meeting? Meeting. We have. We've gone back. Um, we've gone back four times since um, the last board hearing, uh, just to kind of you know see if there's any questions. We did post some signage. Um, letting them know that they, they, you know, that the Board of Health had had, had uh, suspended the permit in the, uh, in the meantime for tobacco products. Um, we asked if they had any other questions. We also dropped off some letters with uh, Zoom links um, and information for for this hearing, um, and, and that, uh, we didn't we didn't find any other tobacco products in, in the store at the time. Everything was removed from the store. Any other questions? And just a reminder what we're considering this evening. Well, I can read for you uh, from our, um, hold on one second. Um, our guidelines, our um, regulations. Um, it shall be the responsibility of the establishment permit holder and or his or her business agent and not their employees to ensure compliance with all sections of this regulation. This is a section S violations. For violations of the sections of this regulation, the violator shall receive. And it says letter A is about the first violation. Letter B is the second violation. Letter C is in the case of three violations. And letter D says, in the case of four violations or repeated egregious violations of any section of this regulation, as determined by the Board of Health, the Board of Health shall hold a hearing in accordance with this regulation, and after such hearing, shall permanently revoke a tobacco sales permit. Thank you. May I clarify for myself? Um, Donna, when you went um, to the store and found violations uh, the first time, most recently, that was the fourth infraction, correct? And then you went back again, and was that the fifth, or am I not understanding the sequence? Correct. The fourth would have been the first time. The second time you went back would have been called the fifth, yes. So that was the fifth, okay. Um, and keeping in mind that uh, there were there were multiple violations. I think we were counting up to about 27 over the last, um, you know, visits, um, but we weren't stacking them. We were counting them only as one altogether. Understood. I just wanted to know the number of episodes and mm -hmm. make sure I understood them. Thank you. You're welcome. May, um... oh, you just muted yourself, Meredith. Darn it. Sorry. Um, may I just add at the time of the fifth violation, 
at that point in time, there was supposed to be no tobacco or nicotine products on the premise, in the premise of the store. They were supposed to be removed completely and they were selling them out of crates and out of backpacks. So it was very, um, you know, they were doing it discreetly not to be caught. Does anybody have any other questions for Donna? Um, I do. Yes, I, I think I know this, but none of the violations actually involved selling to somebody underage. Is that correct? That's correct. Mr. Vieira, would you like to yes. make any comments? Yes. Um, first, uh, I mean, I think it's quite clear here based upon the evidence. You know, my client acknowledges this. These these violations did happen. They are unacceptable. And quite frankly, my client acknowledges that they are unable to have the bandwidth to be able to running this store and make, making sure that their employees are making the correct, correct decisions. Whether or not, um, you know, whether or not they're there, the employees need to be following the rules and need to be not selling these products. Um, accordingly, they are planning, they've entered into a purchase and sale agreement, you know, an acknowledgement that this business just quite simply is not going to be something they can continue to run. Um, they're looking to sell the business. We have a, an agreement in place. It is a, uh, I th believe we sent that over to Meredith. We're relatively early in the process, but we're looking at about 30 to 45 days until it closes. You know, given that the permit here is going to be revoked and we're looking to get, you know, a owner in here who's responsible, approved by the ABCC to take over that operation, um, you know, I would just request a continuance. Again, uh, we will provide whatever information the board wants while we're working through this process to ensure to the board that this buyer is indeed a third party, um, that we're gonna get someone responsible in here. Again, they'll be willing to interview with the board if the board wants to speak to the new owners. Um, and my client is also willing to pay any fines um, that have accrued as a result of these violations. You know, it, it happened and they realized that those fines need to be paid. Um, so they're just looking for a continuation because recognizing a revocation of this license, it would it would destroy the business and really a business out of that operation without a permit would be, if you know these businesses are they're they're low margin businesses driven on volume, so it's it's really going to be difficult to have a business there without this permit. Um, so that's why they're seeking it. it's a continuation for thirty days to check on the status of the sale. Um, and again, we'll pay the fines and we'll provide whatever information the board wants to provide their you know, necessary assurances that, you know, this is moving forward and it's the correct purchaser. Thank you. Thank you. Meredith, can you uh, clarify some issues? Sure, absolutely. Um, so give me one second, please. So you've, you've got a choice here. Um, we have a, in our regulation, we have a cap of 24 permits and we reduce through attrition. Currently, we have 24 permitted merchants. And in our regulation, uh, section E, number nine, maximum number of tobacco sales permits, it states if any permit is surrendered, revoked, or not renewed, and then there is a bunch of language in there, um, that we will we will retire that permit. So if the board moves forward tonight to revoke the permit from this establishment, the permit will be retired and then we'll go down to the 23 permits in the city of Northampton. And there won't be an opportunity for the business that's buying Racing Mart to have a tobacco license unless another store gives up their license for whatever reason. So if you choose to not continue the, the hearing and allow them to go through, you know, the sale in, in, in good faith and producing some documentation along the way, which I provided to his, um, uh, Kyle's um, colleague, Matt, um, on what a bona fide sale really looks like, because we've seen sales and transfers that were to relatives or friends for just a very, you know, nominal amount of money. Um, so if they can go ahead with the sale and prove that it's a bona fide sale, then it would leave 
the tobacco permit open where the new owner could come in and then apply for the permit. But if you revoke the permit, there will be no permit for the new buyer to have. So it's in the board's hand on if they want to move forward with this hearing and make a decision or um, continue the hearing. So just to clarify, if we were to continue and give them some time to make this sale, then at the end of that time period, what would be the finding? Well, it'd be a new owner, so you wouldn't be revoking. So um, the finding that is probably a legal question. Um, I'm I'm not sure. Um, Lisa Stevens Goodnight from Mass Municipal Association is here. Hi, Lisa. Thank you for popping on. I know you're under the weather a little bit. Hi. Um, my name is Lisa Stevens. Good night. Uh, can you hear me? I was having some problem with my head. Okay, great. Um, my name is Lisa Stevens. Good night. I'm the director of tobacco control with the Massachusetts Municipal Association, and I provide legal technical assistance through the uh, Massachusetts tobacco control program um, to cities and towns across the Commonwealth. It's kind of my quick uh, thing. So um, I'm not a town's lawyer. You would, um, you know, you should kind of refer to them for, for real legal questions, but um, in terms of the finding, you you could find that there that there had just been a transfer of business. Um, that would be that would be a reasonable finding, and then they would come in. You kind of treat them as if they're a new retailer, but without having to pull the, the license, um, because again, if it doesn't sound like there is one available, so that would significantly impact the sale, obviously. Um, so yes, yeah, so you would just find that there's a new owner. And Meredith, the new owner would then have to apply for that license or it would yeah. automatically go to them? Well, it they would have to apply for the license, um, but we have in our regulation, um, um, and I don't know offhand what section it is, if there is a sale or transfer within the time that the license is held for a period of time, if it's a like business model. If it's not, then it just is retired. I recall having uh, quite extensive conversations when we were last revising the regulations about the impact on the potential sale of these establishments if the tobacco license were no longer available. Um, and I, as I recall, we attempted to be understanding of the fact that uh, we were making a decision as to whether this business would have no value whatsoever or little value or could continue. And that if we um, did not allow the transfer of the license without a uh, penalty that um, that was it. I mean, there was just, that was, that was the end of that business. Uh, so I think we all took it very seriously of the potential implications. That's my recollection. I don't know if you remember Joanne and Cynthia. I know in past discussions with, um, some of the small business owners, they said that cigarette sales or nicotine sales were something around 40% of their business. So not mm -hmm. having that would be very difficult for their business. Yeah. And this, this language of a like business model, Meredith, um, say the gas station was, dispensing of gas was done away with. So would that be considered not a like business model? No, I think or... it's just the convenience store model, you know, so, okay. yeah, mm -hmm. tobacco and maybe, you know, it's other incidentals, lottery, whatever. Mm -hmm. I think the, the yeah. thought was, Cynthia, if the current business sold and then the, a clothing store went in, then it would retire officially. Got it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Janet, Janet, you're on mute. 
You're mute. I'm, I'm going to unmute her. There we go. Sorry about that. That's so nice. um, you made reference to sometimes uh, there might be a situation where a transfer would go to somebody who's still in the same family or in some other way connected where it, I, I'm not sure I completely understood that piece and and if that's something that we'd be able to consider as part of this or not. Oh, absolutely. So, um, you know, I've been um, helping the Pioneer Valley Tobacco Coalition, you know, stepping in the coordinator role for about six or seven years now. So I've attended um, hundreds of hearings when there have been tobacco violations. And, you know, after the first violation, especially now with the new state law, the penalties are very steep. You know, most local regulations are $100, 200 300 and then zero suspension days, maybe one to three to seven. That's the structure. And the state is 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, up to 30 days the first um seven the second and 30 days i think the third something like that so the violations are very steep i say that because what happens was if a, a, a store has a second and or a third violation within a certain period of time we call a tolling period which is usually 36 months we don't have a tolling period in our regulation they get worried what happens if we have another violation so after like the second violation we'll see a sale very common see a sale of the store but it's not a bona fide sale it's really just a sale to a partner so it's a change of name um, so, you know, we as coordinators, and I'm sure Cheryl Sabara and Lisa can say too, like, that's just skirting the law. So you get a fresh start and everything starts at zero again. And so they've come up, MTCP has come up with some really good guidance on what a bona fide sale should look like, what we should be requiring as a health department and or a board of health um, when there is a sale when it comes to a point where there's multiple violations and then a sale occurs. Um, I had spoken just a couple minutes ago about our um, attempt to be understanding of the implications of our decisions on whether this business was viable. And after we had that careful discussion, uh, my understanding is that this business not only acquired a fourth violation, but then ignored the order to cease the sale of these products. Because we we had that discussion about, about being um, sensitive to business needs a long time ago. Um, so I, I don't know what to say about um, not just another sale, but the fact that soon after more products were found in the same store despite the order to see sales. That's uh, something to really consider in this case. Well, I think that um, Mr. Vieira has told us that Mr. Patel acknowledges uh, wrongdoing and his inability to sort of oversee his store to the standards that we were looking for and is now making a sale. So that business will be gone. The question is whether to make it possible for another owner to step in to that location. So Meredith, you had mentioned um, your thoughts about vetting an, a new owner? Not vetting, um, but I think, you know, we have the right for anyone that we permit to come in and talk about their business model. And I know for certain that our youth know to go to Racing Mart to buy flavored products, um, that they can get away with it there. Um, so if we have a new owner come in, I'd like to bring them in and talk about what are they going to do to prevent the sale of prohibited products and the sale to minors. 
Um, it's my understanding right now from talking to uh, Mr. Vieira's colleague, um, Matt, I can't remember his last name. Porter. Matt Porter, thank you. Um, Mr. Porter um, mentioned that the new owner is actually an employee of Racing Mart right now or an employee of the corporation. So it gives me pause, you know, if they worked for someone that I characterize as a bad actor in the you know, in the tobacco business that, you know, that these, um, it might be learned, like, this is what they do. I'm not sure. I, I don't want to project too much, but um, that was my first thought when he said that this, the person that's buying, he believes works for the organization. They have multiple stores and works for one of them. He didn't tell me which one. But that so I really want to question them. What are they going to do? to prevent having products in their store that are prohibited by state and local law and prevent sales to minors. And can we first know that this is um, like a bona fide sale? Like before right. we make any well, decision. Your decision today would have to be, um, you know, on the word of, of Mr. Vieira saying, you know, we're selling this in good faith to a bona fide, you know, a uh, purchaser. Um, and then we've asked for documentation for them to prove that once the sale has gone through. Yeah, and like I said, I will, I will, or uh, attorney Porter will supply any information you need. Um, you know, we will make it clear to the, the, from my understanding, you know, I just jumped into this yesterday. But from my understanding, the individual is going to be purchasing the business is a employee of a different store, not of Racing Mart. Um, there's no familial relationship here either, just to make that clear. Um, but again, I would just ask that you continue the hearing. You know, you know, if you make a decision that this is not a bona fide purchase, well, that's a decision the board makes and we'll have to live with it. But I would, I would just request that that decision at least be the vetting happen first. And then we ask the board can make a second decision as to the revocation. Um, I'm trying to think through the sequence of, of this. If we continue this and the purchase goes through, it seems to me there will be even more pressure on us to approve the license for the new owner as I bought this, this business with the understanding that I would have a, a tobacco license. And that's that's not so now. Um, and the previous owner is out of the picture. So, um, can I please speak to that? Oh, I'm sorry, Suzanne. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, so typically the way that these uh, transactions are structured is that they are contingent upon the approval of the license. Um, I don't, I assume there's a licensing commission in Northampton. Um, typically the licensing commissions and the Board of Health are working hand in hand, so they're very well aware of what's going on. So, you know, the way that it could be done is the Board of Health alerts the Licensing Commission of what's going on here, um, what needs to happen with your vetting and the approval before they'll approve the license. And that has happened in other instances. So these deals are always contingent on the Licensing Commission approval first and foremost. I think we're talking about a license to sell tobacco products, not a license to have the store. And that, I understand, is our decision, not the, not any other licensing board. Right. So would you, uh, I can do something in the agreement where the, I, and I show it to the board of health that there is a contingency here, that there is a, nothing will move forward unless the board of health approves the license first, because that's how it would be anyway. It just depends on which commission is hearing it in Northampton. It's the board of health by license. I do mean a license to sell tobacco products. But it, it's, it's, it's not so much the granting of it. It is not allowing the license anymore. We take the license away. The health department makes the decisions about granting the license, but we have the, the power to take the license away, suspend the license. Right. I understand that, but the sale would be contingent upon you or the Board of Health approving it right. and not being taken away. So nothing can move forward until that decision is made is how these typically work. Okay. So um, in order to sort of vet the sale to think to verify that it's a bona fide sale 
um, someone, Meredith, or someone else would need to see the agreement, need to see the pricing, need to see sort of the documents um, before the sale happens. Because after the sale happens, I mean, I don't think any new owner would, should, would or should sign that agreement until they know for sure that that license is moving forward. So I think it wouldn't be a completed sale, I think, um, at the time we were to revisit it. But I think all the paperwork would have to be in order and sort of the uh, agreement be all in writing that we could see. Does that sound right? I agree that that would be my envision of how this would proceed. I would appreciate the city solicitors um, opinion as to what happens if we find out later that what we thought was a um, a verified sale, in fact, was not. Um, and I say that because we have an owner who has repeatedly ignored the regulations. Repeatedly. So, um, and that, I understand, was to be able to continue to sell to make money. So I, my trust level is not very high at, at this point. I hear what you're saying, Mr. Beer, but my trust level is not high. No, and I understand, and, you know, I wouldn't expect it to be, you know, based upon my client's behavior um, to date. You know, and if, if the city solicitor wants to contact Attorney Porter or myself, and if, you know, if it would be to the board's, you know, approval to have some language in any agreement that we have, that makes it clear that if there is a bona, this is determined to not be a bona fide sale, you know, that's subject to revocation. You know, that's something that we would be happy to discuss and put into any agreement if that's what the board would so require. Getting into some, um, as a board, some new territory here and, and for Meredith to have that burden of viable sale and I, I don't know. Is that something we want to get into? It is in our regulation. We do speak to um, uh, section um, whatever it was, um, E10, uh, we talk about a bona fide sale. So it, it's in our regulation. It's in our purview. So I feel like, yeah. And I, mean, I guess what I'm referring to is that, you know, the clause and if this, then that, I know, I know. and, yeah. you know, I mean, it, it can get to be, th that's not what we do. It's not what we do for sure. <laughs> that's, but, mm -hmm. that's legal. That's business. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask, is this a franchise? Uh, I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but I can provide that information tomorrow to Meredith. Cause I know limited knowledge sales of, franchises are different than turning over an entire business i don't believe that it is to, to be honest looking at the agreement itself typically or there'll be a franchise separate franchise agreement involved so i don't believe okay. that meredith are you comfortable between you and attorney seawald perhaps um deciding if this paperwork is um adequate to call it a bona fide sale but it wouldn't it it would be before the sale happens unless yeah probably yeah i don't want to speak for attorney seawald you know i'm not really sure you know where his specialties lie um but i'm sure between attorney seawald cheryl spara and lisa stevens good night um i could get some really good guidance on you know on how to proceed when looking at these and reviewing the documentation that they provide. Lisa, does that sound right? Is that in your purview? Yeah, I've, I've, I've worked with a number of towns on helping, um, you know, with this process, because it is kind of, it's, you know, there's two sides of it. You, you definitely don't want to um, have a huge financial impact on people, especially when they are um, doing the right thing, which it sounds like these retailers are here, that they, they cannot stay in compliance. So they are finding someone else to, to do that. Um, and and also making sure that that's a real sale. So yes, we have a lot of experience, and I can definitely work with Meredith in your in your city to or your town to make sure that happens. Is it possible for us to not allow this particular owner to own an, an, another store that has a tobacco license in the future? Is that is that anything that it's possible for us to do? Because I don't want um, 
I, I know some, if, if this person were to buy another convenience store, they would need to um, uh, apply for that permit for the health department. Um, but I'm, I'm just very, I, I think it was very troubling what happened with this particular owner in this particular store after we really um, tried very hard to understand the perspective that he brought. So we do have precedence, the legality of it. I'm not really sure. About, <laughs> um, <laughs> we had some bad actors in the septic world and we reported them to DEP on multiple occasions and then end up writing them a letter that they're not allowed to do work in Northampton any longer. Wasn't challenged. Um, again, I don't know the legality of it. Um, so there, this um, this has been challenged actually in the tobacco world um, and another, and I don't remember the the exact circumstances off the top of my head. Um, but it was it was effectively that a town was they hadn't sold the store the same owner and the same, but the it, the, the owner had repeatedly appeared before the board for a number of years. Um, and had put a lot of safeguards in place and they were continuing to do so you can't kind of do it in in you know perpetuity you can't for, give a lifetime ban um to own a, a convenience store but anytime they they apply for a permit you can have them come before you and, and ask them the question of you know what demonstrate to us how it'll be different this time um so and they you know a, a retailer doesn't have a right to a permit they have it's you know it's a privilege, not a right to be able to sell tobacco. So you, you don't have to give them, but you wouldn't be able to kind of like say there's a blanket ban. You're never allowed to have one in here um, in this town. That's kind of be my advice. Thank you, Lisa. So Lisa, there is precedence well, or, or your advice is that at, at any point in time when somebody applies for a permit, we have the right to say no. Yes, you always, you have the right to say no. Um, as I said, you kind of you can't kind of from this point say going forward we would never, but you can say that we every time yes. you review, rem you can look back at their back at their past behavior, um, in in making that determination. There are a lot of issues up in the air, and um, I for one. Uh, I'm not comfortable about making a decision with with this impact at this at this moment in time, given that um, uh, given the array of of issues we've been talking about recent in the, over the past few minutes. I, I hear you, Suzanne, and I'm wondering specifically what it is that we need, and, and I'm not challenging, I'm just asking what specifically we need to help us feel comfortable making a decision of um, continuance, I guess that's, or doing this bargain of this letter with conditions, you know. Um, I, I do feel like we're in this territory that can go in a variety of directions here. Yeah. Right, right. All right. Are you agreeing? Yeah, Simply yeah, yeah. There's yeah. just a lot of lot of issues unresolved at this point in time. But I just I I would like to pin them down. You know, like what they are, what we need, and what Meredith needs. And yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you have the answers. I'm just looking for yeah, that. I yeah. don't. I I I. It, it it seems we've been talking about a number of issues about uh, assurances in the potential sale. Um, and I, I, <laughs> and I think we have to decide if it, regardless of, of the impact on one individual or one individual family, um, because of the, the terrible impact of tobacco, especially on our youth. Uh, is this an opportunity to reduce our number of licenses by one? Mm -hmm. Not from anything that we did, but but this is the situation in front of us. Do we want to allow this number of licenses to go forward? Um, 
given what has happened with this particular license. That's not a guarantee it'll happen in the future, but we have a poor track record with this particular license. Do we say this license doesn't go forward? Meredith, do you know um, who the new owner is and if that person owns any other stores and what their record has been? Uh, I believe Kyle, it's on the PNS, which I don't have in front of me. Yeah, it's. Uh, I can pull that up really quick if that'll be helpful. Uh, while he's doing that, I, I'm wondering uh, how long the current owner has owned the store and just because of what Meredith said earlier about this particular location, having this reputation, um, if he hasn't owned it long, did it have that reputation even prior to him? Is this something about, I don't know, where it's located or, you know, the reputation that's garnered over many, many years? Or I'm just curious, how long has he been, has he owned this store? Kelly might be able to answer that. Might take her a few minutes though to look it up. I mean, the other thing is we all know deals, people pull out of deals all the time. So we've uh, had a continuance and then this deal gets pulled. You know, do we just keep doing this until a good deal comes? <laughs> well, I'd have to say no. I mean, we're even extending our regulation um, a bit because it says under the sale of business um, E10B, the purchaser, the purchaser shall apply for the transfer of the permit no later than 30 days, calendar days after said purchase. So like we're already giving grace here, um, <clears throat> you know, by extending extending this process. Um, but I do, you know, I, I, I do think there's a valid point if we decide to continue this until the sale goes through. And I think you should put a finite amount of time on what that looks like 30 days or 60 days. I wouldn't, I wouldn't let this go on too long that, um, we don't, for lack of better words, punish the new owner. You know, we have to think of the new owner as a fresh brand new business. And of course, have a conversation and let her know what happened in the, him or her know what happened in the past. But, um, you know, be optimistic that someone who is buying this business um, will do the right thing. I don't want to go, I don't want this person to have a black mark against them just because of the prior business's um, business model on what they wanted to do or how they wanted to make money. I have the name. Uh, the name is Gina Marie Boyer. And she is of Indian Orchard, Massachusetts. And this corporation was formed in 2019, but this is formed usually takes six to eight months. So this is probably end of 19, around 2020 is the when this business was purchased. Uh, Mr. Vieira, can this sale be um, put in place with the contingency that we're talking about in in the before our next board meeting? Um, so we could do, yeah, I, but by that, do you mean, do you want, I can do an amendment to this agreement that makes it clear what we talked about today, that the license, that the sale is contingent upon approval or, um, approval of the buyer by the Northampton, uh, board of health. Um, and then would you like us to have the buyer come to that next meeting? And then in the interim, we will supply all information, you know, related to the buyer, the assignment of the lease, all materials like that well i'm i'm not as concerned about the new buyer as i yeah. am about this business being sold it, if if this is the position that's been been proposed for us that the, the way to get out of these multiple violations and to bring an end to this these business practices is to sell the business and then it doesn't occur well we're in a we're in a whole different ball game um, so obviously we need the approval at the next meeting before we could, so, you know, I could have it, I could, 
you know, say to you today that prior to December's meeting, we could have it closed because we need the November meeting to have approvals and to have for, I assume, so you, the board can have further discussion, but um, I can do 60 days. We can close. And, you know, that's, that's, that's the finite time. The board, the board has to have a contingency. This approval is based on this being sold that if it's not sold, the, um, we will move forward with the penalties. Um, if the board would be willing to do 60 days, I, I could I could make sure that it gets done. Or if it doesn't, then my client if it falls through, then my client's permit gets revoked. That's that's the situation that they've put themselves in, unfortunately. So the inf some information that I would like about the new buyer is if they have um, owned any stores that sold uh, tobacco products or nicotine products and in what towns and um Meredith, are you able to get information about other towns about violations is that mm -hmm. something information you could get mm -hmm. okay absolutely and maybe um and and or um liquor as well if they had held a liquor license and if there were any violations what gives me pause is for us to um, move forward with the fines and closing the business today gives us no opportunity to learn anything new or no opportunity to um, be better informed about this particular sale. That's it. It's a death sentence. Fair. Right. As far as, as, far all, as a convenience store is concerned. In all likelihood, if um, the person trying to purchase does not is not able to get a, a nicotine permit, it seems unlikely the sale would go through. Um, Mr. Vieira, do you agree with that? Yeah, uh, you know, I'm not going to say 100%, but, you know, if there's no permit, the chance of selling the business whatsoever is extremely low. The The... Unfortunately or fortunately, you know, nicotine is the highest, one of the highest margin items, whether or not that's a good thing, but that's just, you know, the state of the market. It's not a good thing. Yeah, I agree. Are there any more questions or comments on this? I guess I would just want to say, I, I want to make sure we have enough guardrails up because we already um, granted a continuance. Um, and we're we're I think we're really um, really acknowledging the difficulty of this situation, um, but I just don't want to have to be back here again <laughs> if this doesn't work. I I just you know I think we just have got to commit to to an end game here, if we if we can at least in our minds. I don't know how others feel about that. I feel like I'm hearing the same thing from everybody that nobody wants to just say this is the end um, that I think we're all wanting to consider the continuance under the kind of framework that um, both Meredith and uh, Mr. Vieira have laid out so that um, it would only be up to 60 days uh, we'd have a lot more information about the new owner, including if there's any violations in if if she has uh, owned other stores, things like that. And we can still make the decision within the 60 days to take the license away. Um, and that person can make the decision if they still want to buy the store or not, knowing what our decision is based on us having more information. That's and I will say, I'm sorry, Meredith did provide a quite detailed email as to what she expects and what the board expects as for additional information. So we will comply and collect all of that information. My understanding is um, if it doesn't, go forward appropriately with the current um, potential purchaser, 
there's not enough time to line up another purchaser. So if this purchase does not go through, it seems to me that it's at that point that we say, we're going to have to impose the fines. Does everyone agree with that? I mean, I, I don't want to, yep. to be dealing with multiple potential purchasers coming in to us and saying, oh, I want it. And then they find out what's going on. Oh, I want, that's not going to happen. It, it, I'm, it, I'm a, I'm confused. I thought they've already paid the fine. Yeah, you don't mean fines. You mean the penalty. Uh, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, the penalties, the penalties, not the fine, the penalties. So revoking the license. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That, thank you, <laughs> Janet. <laughs> That's what it is. <laughs> um, yes, I think that there's there are no more um, continuances for any reason after that. Um, this is only to uh, the, the owner came forward to us with a with a plan to sell. And this is his one opportunity to do that, as far as I'm concerned. In, in the meantime, Donna keeps going into the establishment. Donna, have you visited again? Oh, you're muted for some reason. We can't hear you. Donna was there three days ago, I think, serving notice of the hearing again, and will continue to do follow-up inspections. It is with the understanding um, with uh, Mr. Porter and Mr. Vieira that there shall be no tobacco during this or nicotine during this whole deliberation. Confirmed. Thank you. Um, any other questions or comments? Would someone like to make a motion? Janet, it sounds like you had that language pretty down pretty well. What I said before. <laughs> uh, I'll make a motion. Carol, Kelly, get out your pen. <laughs> and uh, yeah, others can elaborate uh, that we grant a continuance at this meeting for. Um, I don't. I don't know if I want to say up to sixty days or through two more board of health meetings. So Meredith, you might want to say, um, but anyway, about 60 days at which time um, and during which time Meredith will get a lot of information about the new owner and the history of that new owner in terms of this matter. Um, and What else? If we're, if, uh, Jen, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but you talked about two board meetings. We ca we have an exact date for that, which is December 19th. So is that 60 day? Is that... that that's two board meetings. It's not necessarily 60 days, but it's two board meetings. 60 days, I don't think um, is... is uh, Would be that makes sense for, us for, our, for our meetings. You could just say, you know, with information to be given at the November board meeting and uh, final decisions on the de December board meeting. Thank you. Does that sound right? right. Okay. So that's, that's what I'm proposing. Any I discussion? Is there a second? I second that. Any d further discussion? Proposal for continuance with information, further information at our November meeting and a decision at our December meeting. All in favor? Cynthia? Yes. Suzanne? Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Thank you. So um, this will be on our November meeting agenda. And yep. we'll have some information to review. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, board members. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Yes, thank you, Donna. <laughs> and Meredith, when in all that would we hear or would we hear from a new owner in terms of a game plan to you know, what strategies or whatever they would be putting in place um, so that they can avoid having the same kind of thing happen where if they're not in the store, an employee sells or mm -hmm. something. Like mm -hmm. what? I'm sure there are stores that are successful at this that mm -hmm. don't 
spun into violation. Mm -hmm. So when would we hear or be able to talk? Does the board want to hear from the new owner or do you want us at the DHHS to have these conversations? When the uh, when every year or when there is a new owner, a new permit, they have to sign off that they've read the regulations, that they understand they can't sell to anyone under 21. They understand that they can't sell um, flavored products. So there is a sign off sheet. There is education that goes out with the permit. So um, usually we handle that in house. But if you'd like the new owner to come to the Board of Health meeting, that's up to you. But I would, you know, um, I, I can discuss, I feel very confident in my um, skills to discuss with the owner about um, things that they can utilize at their disposal, that are at their disposal to help curb any of these things from happening. Like there are, um, you know, um, card readers to read a license. There is online training for your employees in multiple language available that they could do on a regular basis. So there are things that they can do to help this from happening in their stores. Um, but, you know, I think in this specific case, it was from the top down. I believe they knew this was happening. They were bringing the product in. We're usually a lot of times... I'm hearing that this was a new employee and they made the sale or they didn't know this product was flavored. So I'm happy to have the conversations, but if you want to have them, I'm happy to ask the new owner to come in and and, and speak to you all. I don't remember ever hearing from a potential licensee in the past. I don't think we've had a lot of transfers of permits. I don't remember. We have had a lot, but they just don't come before you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm really comfortable uh, with you doing it. Do you guys, do you want to weigh in on whether you want the new owner to come to us in November or December? I'm totally fine with Meredith doing it. Me as well. I am too. I just, um, you you seem very certain about this particular location and young people going there to get flavored products and everything. So, uh, you know, I just don't know if, I, I'm sure what you do in the training you give, I, I'm not questioning it. I just don't know if this new owner is gonna need to understand that as well. Culture at the store. It's not the first time that we've had um, stores that were known to either provide flavored products when it was prohibited or sell, you know, sell to minors. Um, we've had some uh, two other stores that I can think of offhand that were known, you know, you give a certain um, keyword or password to the clerk and you could get your product. So we, um, I'm never going to say we're going to be ahead of the game, but we catch on pretty fast and, you know, figure out who the bad actors are. So I'm confident in our staff, Amy, and the inspectional service crew that we have. And, you know, we're part of the PBTC um, collaborative. So there's a lot of education. There's a lot of checks, both, you know, in-house and externally happening that. Yeah, as, as long as the new owner understands. <laughs> right, yeah. I mean, right. mm -hmm. right. I'm, I'm comfortable, Meredith, with you, with you um, educating and talking to the new owner, but I would like you to bring that information about their prior ownership and violations um, to us. Mm -hmm. The uh, best that I can uncover it, for sure. Like if they were under an LLC, it's hard to find names. Mm -hmm. And I think Lisa could probably attest to that. I don't know why that is. Um, but if there's an LLC, you don't have to um, divulge owner's names. Lisa, is that correct? So they, they have to list corporate officers. There's like a, a separate, separate part. Can, with LLC, they can get a little tricky. Um, but yeah, that's why we kind of ask for other documents because you want to make sure it's transferred as an LLC, but also that there's other things that are transferred. So like one thing we look at a lot is like lottery, have they transferred, if they have lottery, have they transferred over their lottery license? Have they transferred over their, if they have a liquor license, their liquor license, what just, uh, what are those other 
licenses that they would have transferred over has the lease been transferred over and has the company been transferred over and then is it you know is this is the purchase and sale price something that seemed that is reasonable for the area any any last questions we have we will have to officially close the hearing so um any further comments on this would anyone uh, thank, like a motion? thanks thanks to donna and move to close second discussion all in favor cynthia yes suzanne yes Anna? yes joanne yes Thank you. The hearing is closed. It's 6.59 p.m. Okay. Thank you, everyone. That was not easy. Um, all right. More information. Review of the draft regs. Uh, Meredith, what do you, do you recommend? Uh, how do we go about this? Do you want to go page by page? Um, uh, would anyone like a five-minute break? Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. Why don't we take uh, it's um, seven o'clock right now. Why don't we come back about five after? Okay. Okay. Thank you.
All right, I see everyone coming back on. <clears throat> Great idea, Meredith. I can eat my dinner. I know. <laughs> dinner, bathroom, quick. <laughs> well, if I take my camera off, it's because I'm eating. <laughs> okay, 7.05, we're back. Um, Meredith, what do you think is the best way to do this? Well, um, so Amy and um, Donna and myself went through our regulation and we cross-referenced the model regulation, which I introduced to the board several months back. And what we did is provided you a merge document. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So let me, I have printed it out and took it home. And some, let's see. So basically what we did was um, the definition section we made sure that everything that was in the model regulation we had in our definition section. We recently updated our regulation, so we were in a very good spot. Um, when you see on page three in red, you'll see some cross outs and then some additions. We incorporated the um, model regulation definition into our regulation. So for instance, healthcare institution, we we amended that definition so it's all inclusive of the model. And then manufacturer documentation is all in red. We didn't have that in our last iteration, so we included it. Oral nicotine pouches, we defined that um, in its entirety. We didn't have that before. Under rolling papers on page four, we just inserted um, the word wraps to make sure that that was inclusive because that's been challenged a lot. And Lisa can tell you, you know, the reason why we want to adopt the model regulations is because some of the language that we've used in recent iterations has been challenged in court. So we want to make sure that what we're using um, can hold up. Um, Do you have this version electronically? Mm, yes, I do. You share that as we go along. It's very hard to follow this without having it in front of us. Um, I did give it to you. Which one is the document? I sent it. This, I, so the day I sent you the agenda and the minutes, I sent a following email. But okay. I can bring it up. Let me see if I can bring it up quickly. Is that the one that has red on it? Mm hmm Okay. Red and yellow. I've, yep. I've got it. Let me see. <clears throat> give me one second. Amy, why don't you continue to talk while I try to find this? Um, I can share. Hold on. You're muted, Amy. Yeah. <laughs> so um, basically, uh, Meredith was just discussing like how we merged it together. And um, it really, until you look at it, you can't really see like how, how it was done. But um some things are crossed off that were not on the state regs, as I believe. So you'll see those cross off marks. Um, the yellow is what uh, was state recommended. The green is what was locally recommended. Some things you were already doing from, from what the model regs said. So they were already in there. So that's something to say also. I'm trying to think of other, other, uh, I have it. I just am not allowed for some reason to share. Okay, I can give you those permissions. You know, the the one we got doesn't, except for the highlight at the top in green that says why the green, what the green means. I didn't see any other green. Yeah, same here. It was red because it was like written. It was, uh, you know, edited. Right. Yeah. It was red and there was yellow highlight but there was no green. But Joanne, as a host, you should be able to share. I couldn't find the share feature fast enough. I just okay. gave you those powers. Um, does everyone see that? Yeah. Yeah, so this is, is this the right version? 
Yes. October 4th. Okay, so so we had amended our regs relatively recently, so I don't think there's going to be that much. Uh, so here, what uh, definition of a healthcare institution? Mm -hmm. You want to speak to this? I I mean, if you want me to, it. I don't know if you want to go over definition each and every definition well just sort of what things are different from what we had before so this was recommended in the draft um model so, regs. Mm -hmm. yeah so lisa will come on as well to speak to this but it's you know still restricting sales of tobacco nicotine and healthcare institutions except it's exempting um places that have um opticians or um, audiology services. So I'm thinking like maybe a Costco might be the intent of this, Lisa. So this is weirded wordly, okay. worded weirdly, <laughs> not weirded wordly, it's worded weirdly. Um, and I, the reason is, is because it's, I think it's pulled straight from the state law, which is why it's, I helped draft these and I'm trying to remember why we worded it this way. Um, but basically, so there's there is an exemption um, in state law for like optometrists and other um, like kind of those in-service places. So and this this came up at a different board of health meeting. So it's not like eyeglasses. Uh, so if you were to go get like reading glasses, it's not kind of a 7-Eleven that sells reading glasses. It's it's kind of the prescription eyeglasses. Uh, there's a an exception carved out in state law that, that they are not included in the healthcare institution um, prohibition. Um, and it was to exempt, uh, I think Costco and BJ's are kind of the two examples that we look to because they provide, they sell both um, tobacco products and provide these services. So it was, if a town chooses, it's an option to include them in that language. Um, but some towns don't have these uh, so if you don't have a Costco or a BJ's, this may not even really be relevant for your town. If you do have one, it's you know, it, it, it's one of those that they, they, it's a decision that you can make, um, if, if you want to choose to kind of push the, them out of those stores. Thank you, Lisa. The next, um, definition is manufacturer documentation. This is a requirement of state law as well. Um, so all of your products, you have to have a manufacturer document stating, um, that you're not flavored and what milligram nicotine content it is. It helps when um, the TCOs go out and do inspections that they can refer to these, these guidance documents. Um, oral nicotine pouches, that is um, the recommended language for oral nicotine pouches. However, this would be if we restricted these to adult only would be um, a local regulation, not a state regulation. Smoking bar, we, um, it's in yellow. So that must be the state regulation. Um, you know what? I think I can speak a little to that, Meredith. So um, when, when our last regulation for 2023, we looked at that and then we looked at what the state had there were some and a lot of similarities, but not completely. So it's really either or mm -hmm. kind of thing. So we wanted to give you the option of what you said. You had some of it, but you didn't maybe have all of it. And uh, it, and just a reminder, this is also in the, I think the workplace, is that correct? A smoking bar? Mm -hmm. I remember now when we were doing this, we were what we were trying to do is just update our definition to match the state model regulation, but it was too difficult for smoking bar that we're just like, okay, here's ours, but this in yellow is what the state provides. So it would be easier just to use the state's definition. That's why we highlighted it in yellow. Was there any downside to using the state definition? Would it take away anything from what we had? No. And it's, um, and like Amy said, um, we prohibit smoking bars in our smoke-free workplace regulations. So the definition here is kind of just arbitrary. 
Mm -hmm. Just to have it there. Yeah, just to have it there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, um, I can add, this is this is very specific for towns that have smoking bars so that you can kind of um, make sure that, they're be that they are what they say they are. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have them, it's a little bit, it's not as necessary. On page four, tobacconist, I also, I just included also referred as an adult only retail store because throughout the model regulation, that's how they refer to 21 and over stores as a, um, adult only retail stores, but we use the word tobacconist. So <clears throat> sometimes it's interchanged. That's why I just added that there. Um, do we know if, um, um, are there going to be pot stores coming that allow smoking? Is that going to be a, fuzz, a fuzz, sorry, a fuzzy area? Um, allow consumption on site of marijuana. Is that what you're asking? Well, we prohibit it with our smoke-free workplace regulation. But, um, we may not have the choice to, uh, because the marijuana coalition is a whole their own licensing thing. Is that going to be an issue? Become an issue? I can speak to this. It may. Uh, there's I, I I I can't divine the purpose like the the thought process of the cannabis control commission. Um, but it may become an issue. The state law that passed kind of pulls a lot of things out of tobacco and put like, so the cannabis get, got pulled out of tobacco and put into um, its own thing. Um, and that's put some of these things up into, into question. Um, so yeah. So, so the, I guess that would kind of be my answer is it may um, right now. I do not believe that they are allowing onsite. They, they've kind of been like floating different ways that they would happen for onsite consumption. And then I, Last I checked, but I, I, I focus on tobacco, so I, I'm not completely up on the cannabis laws. I've, last I checked, they had not, they are not allowing it at this time. Um, and then there are some towns, and this is something I would I would actually have Cheryl, because she works with health boards on a, a wider range of topics. Um, but if you're concerned about that, I would have her come in, because there are some options that the Board of Health could look at um, to either regulate or just oversee or prohibit cannabis but you because the law kind of pulls those out we like to kind of keep them separate as well and put that like that wall up um because you don't we don't want the kind of the tobacco laws to be impacted by the cannabis laws um especially because you know there are different there are actually very different health concerns around the two different products lisa i i remember when the cannabis commission was formed and how they had special a special jurisdiction. Um, is this is is um, cannabis the one area where the Board of Health cannot make a regulation that's stricter than the state? So, again, I would I would want okay. I would want Cheryl or somebody who's like more of an expert on this area to 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 really give the answer correctly. But for my understanding is that unfortunately the answer is that it's not really clear at this time. Okay. Thank you. I remember when we um, crafted the smoke free workplace law that it was very much in it, with the insight that marijuana was going to be legal at some point. So we were thinking if we prohibit it from our city owned parks, you know, that we were also prohibiting, you know, smoke marijuana like it was mm -hmm. our signs were a tobacco you know tobacco marijuana leaf like we were very you know um thoughtful and mindful in what we were doing at that point in hopes of being able to curtail you know smoking of marijuana wherever smoking of tobacco or nicotine was prohibited you're muted joanne but when the Cannabis Commission was formed, I remember also that we were told, you know, hands off, we have no jurisdiction. So that that's that may become very interesting, but right. it's, it's not happening yet. Um, all right, let's move on. Let's see what else there is. Um, we just took out 
a copy of the law. So I think we're on page eight. So page say, eight at the top. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, E12 sale of business. No, nope, we're on E13. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, tobacco product sales permit will not be renewed if the permit holder has sold a tobacco product to a per uh, person under the age of 21 three times within the previous permit year and the time period to appeal has expired. So I, I thought we didn't have a time frame on that. We don't have a tolling period, but this is even more, let's see. So this came from the model regs or from the state? That was in the model regs, I do believe. Yeah, and this is stricter than ours, I think. Yeah. <clears throat> I, I thought ours is stricter because with, with this one, doesn't it start all over again after a year? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's, yeah. you know, it, um, tobacco sales permit will not be renewed if the permit holder has sold tobacco product to a person, a minor, three times within the previous permit year. So that's just saying immediately, like three times sale to a minor within a year, you're not getting renewed. Okay. That's but my understanding. A lot of the infringements of these stores has been which products they sell. I think it's saying that selling to a minor is a more significant offense. But I guess my question is, what if it they do it three times, but it's over two years? We still want to be able to do that right we, we, well we can because our regulation okay. allows that and we don't have a tolling so sale of business i'm wondering why this is in this section and not in the uh violations section lisa is this a state i'm trying to find it in the model regulation The green and the model regulation is really hard to read through on paper. Mm -hmm. I know I, I've tried many highlighting techniques and I cannot. <laughs> come up. Holy moly, I've never looked at it on paper like this. Um, uh, let's well, see. Wait, wait. They're talking about it in, under the E, so it goes one through 13, and that being the last one. So they're talking about the tobacco product sales permit. So mm -hmm. that does kind of fit in there because they're talking about sales to a minor three times mm -hmm. um, within the, the year. So I think that's why they put it there. Yeah, it's it's about renewal. I, I'm trying to, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think this must come from the sales law because Um, I'm trying to find, I'm, I'm looking at this, the state regulations at the moment and just trying to find it. I can, I, you know, I can, I don't, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I can try to find it. Um, I don't see it. I mean, there's language in other places as well that kind of raises this this con this idea. I mean, because three sales in a previous year is, is probably yeah. would be one of the more egregious violators we've seen. Um, because I think the thing that's always important to remember is those are three sales, but they get caught. <laughs> um, so that means that like an inspector went in three times or with an underage buyer and they got caught in the previous year. Um, so that, that that would be where it comes from. It does look like it is an option that you can adopt, Meredith. I, it, it, it must be from our, our model sales regs. I mean, I like it. I just can't find it. Yeah. In my 
Mm -hmm. yeah. In my version, I have it highlighted where it was included in the state reg. Okay. Oh. So we have to have it. It's included in the state reg. Discussion. How do people feel about this? If it's state regs, we don't have any choice. Right, but if it's model regs, if we have a choice, thoughts? I think we want to keep it in. Yeah, I it, it, it it's correct that it's not in the context of the other um, violations, but I don't have any problem with this. Yes, we, we would do this anyway, whether or not it was in or not, wouldn't we? Or is this stricter? Three sales to a minor would be um, $5,000 and a 30-day suspension. So it is stricter. Um, three sales, to, this is saying three sales to a minor within a permit year. A then, year. Yeah. Um, within the previous permit year. Right, because we have revocation. The permit won't be renewed. Revocation mm -hmm. on the fourth violation, not the third. Oh. And sometimes some towns have like a longer tolling period too. So they would have like 36 uh, months. So that's that's three years. So that means that if you have three violations, so hypothetically, if you have three violations in, sorry, that's not three years. Um, <laughs> uh, but if you had three violations within that 36 pe month period, then you would have, you, or the fourth violation, you would have that revocation hearing. But Okay. Um, this is like kind of also gives another, you've had those three violations. We're kind of going to not give you the opportunity to get a fourth violation in, in that amount of time because it's, it's such a short amount of time. I found um, it. Okay. <laughs> e, E7 on the model regulation. A tobacco sales permit will not be renewed to, to the permit holder. Oh, if the permit holder has sold a tobacco product to a person under the age of 21 or born after a date, I think that's the NFG, three mm -hmm. times within the previous permit year and the time period to appeal has expired. The violator may request a hearing in accordance with subsection six of the violation section. Why don't we have that in there? Yeah. That last um, sentence, Joanne? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think all of our violations, you have the right to appeal. Um, we can add that. Or just put this in the violations section so that it is included in that right to appeal. That's subsection six of the violation. So it's referring to the violation section, right? Mm hmm and so this must be a local decision because it's in green, Lisa? Yeah, that would mean it's a local decision. Yeah, okay. So it's easily moved. <clears throat> so I would probably put it in the violations section and add the line that, uh, well, this says the period time to appeal has expired. That means Seven days after notice, if they haven't appealed. Appealed is is that the same as having asking for a hearing? Mm -hmm. Oh no 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 that's sorry no that that would be no. that would be yeah that would be different. So they have the hearing because with the sale to a minor they are they get a hearing they don't have to ask for a hearing for a sale to a minor. Um, they don't have to appear at the hearing, but they they get a hearing, um, and they're expected to. And then, sorry, and, and so they would, this means at the time to, yeah, to, sorry, to, to appeal to, to a, a court of competent jurisdiction, I think is what the, this, the state regs say. So the appeal is after the hearing. Right. Lisa, I don't know why it was left out, but that, that explanation that you gave sounds like an important one to, you know, someone who has the permit to understand that that they automatically get a hearing. So for the hearing part, we copied 
directly the what the state put into their regulations. And the reason is, is because they are the ones who grant the authority. So we, we want to make sure that, that we're using the, the language that they use. Okay. Um, and, and I would also say that that's kind of my reading of it is that the, for the sale of a minor, they, they get a hearing versus the, um, for the, they have that seven days to request a hearing that a court may find differently on that. Um, but that's just kind of my reading of the state reg and my, and my recommendation of best practice. Thank you. Okay, can I ask one question? So um, we have a sale to a minor, we issue the cease and desist, we automatically schedule a hearing, Lisa? They don't have to appeal to get the hearing? Yes. The cease and desist, we can, we can talk, because I can, I've looked at your cease and desist and it's fine, so okay. we're doing that. Okay. <laughs> like, as long as you... <laughs> So do we have that language from the state somewhere else in our regs, like a back by, by the violation section? That language that you wanted? There should be hearing language in there. There's in the model regs. I'll just take what the model reg says and include it in there. Okay. Nicotine pouches. So that's a local decision, um, and here we're restricting them to tobacconist stores only, which are um, 21 and over <laughs> to walk in <laughs> to the store. Um, you have the word only twice. Any questions about the nicotine pouches? Are there, um, so, did someone just say that the nicotine pouches can be in very low nicotine levels, but also be really high levels? Is there a limit to the milligrams? No. I don't think they're regulated, are they? Oh, we can regulate them, right? Well, we don't, yes. have, the, we don't have the testing capacity. Unless you want to uh, ban them. Lisa, what do you recommend? Uh, so <clears throat> nicotine pouches are one of the fastest growing products we've seen in, in the tobacco product you know, universe. Um, they're taking more and more shelf space. We don't have full <laughs> data just because they're also a relatively new product. They've really taken off in the last year. Um, and... So we're, we're kind of getting that, that data back. But what we can see and, you know, what I th anybody can see really is if you go into a convenience store, you'll see that they're taking up more and more shelf space and they're moving off the shelves very quickly. So the, con and the concern is that these are products that we don't know a ton about kind of what's in them. Um, and they are incredibly discreet to use. So if kids get their hands on them, it's very hard to, to figure out if they're using them. And they have nicotine salts in them, which are, a kind of purified, I don't, so I'm not a chemist and I'm not going to um, pretend to be one in front of you guys, but uh, the, the nicotine salts can come in these higher dosages, which increase addiction. Um, so the thing that I will say is that they are not an approved addiction or cessation product by the FDA. The commercial brands come, Zin is the most popular and it comes in three milligram and six milligram packets. So that was 20 packet per tin, they kind of look like a certs container, like exactly like a certs container actually, um, but they say Zen on them. And they come in three milligram and six milligram dosages. From there, there's a there's a bunch of different brands because again, these are very popular. So you, you start to see a lot more of these brands. Um, and I have seen up to 25 milligrams. I've heard from people that they've seen up to 30 milligrams in a single pouch. And, um, so that's really concerning. Those are very high in, in comparison, uh, the approved cessation devices or products, um, for example, Nicorette gum comes in two and four milligram dosages. So just, you know, when, when comparing it to an approved cessation product, it's not, um, 
it's not at the dosages that you would kind of look to for those. So, so there's that part of it. There's the growing uh, popularity. And, you know, one of the things is that we don't want to cut adults off from these completely, but we do want to make sure that they, that youth access is, is further limited from just the retail environment. Um, because as you've seen tonight, youth do, you know, buy things in the retail environment. These are incredibly popular and they're very hard to kind of, to once, once they're in young people's hands, it's going to be very difficult to kind of find them, find out that they have them. So that's kind of the thought process behind this. Um, as I said, it's, the one thing that boards of health can do is that you don't have to wait for the, the health crisis to emerge. You can say like, these are products that we don't know a ton about. They could have really serious health implications. And until we know more, we just want to restrict the, the access to them until we have more information and we can give a better assessment of whether or not they're dangerous. Um, so that that's, you know, kind of the thought process behind them. As I said, they are one of the fastest growing products. I can provide some data on that. I don't have it handy on me right now, but we've seen really rapid increase. And, I, you know, I just recommend that you go into any retail store and you can see how popular these have become um, it, by how much shelf space they're taking up and, and how, you know, some stores can't even keep it in, in stock because it's moving so quickly off the shelves. Okay, so the tobacconist store is the 21 and older store. So all of the stuff that's in there is available to adults. Mm -hmm. Those who are concerned about accessibility for adults, um, that sounds like the appropriate place for these pouches, not where kids can get them. Understanding there may be other ways to get them, but we're talking about point of sale. How expensive are they? They're cheap. They're not taxed. Yes. They're very inexpensive. They're not taxed. Mm -mm. At this point in Massachusetts, they're not taxed. So they're very cheap. Four or five bucks. Wow. Mm -hmm. When does the state make a decision to tax that? <laughs> Who knew? I asked that question. <laughs> Is there any precedent for limiting uh, how many milligrams they are? So we're working on language to, to offer that option to towns as well. As I said, these are relatively new products. So we're kind of working on the language as, um, you know, at, as towns requested and also as, uh, as and honestly, as we find time to, to kind of sit down and, and make sure that we're drafting good, good language. Um, so that is the... So this is kind of the, the first language we put out. Um, and there's at least one town that I'm working with that wants to put a, a, a do, like a, a milligram. We just have to kind of figure out what that means. Um, because again, we don't want to, we don't want to put cities and towns in the situation where they have to be a chemist or have to do advanced testing because that can be really expensive. Um, and most tobacco control programs don't have the budget to, to do that. So we're, we're trying to figure out how to best provide good enforcement, good and like fair enforcement to everybody without overburdening the tobacco control system. But Lisa, isn't that town a town that doesn't have an adult only store? Right. right. So they, that's a town that doesn't have it. So, mm -hmm. so they would be under this language, they would be doing a full. So they kind of the the direction they're going is that they are interested in, in regulating nicotine pouches, but they are not interested, but they don't want to prohibit them in their town at this point. So we're working out kind of different language to, to make that possible. Any other questions or comments about that? How many, it, how many adult stores do we have? Three, possibly four. What's the possible Meredith? <laughs> I knew you were going to ask that Cynthia. <laughs> The vault, um, and Kelly was looking into that for me. We weren't sure if it was adult only. There might be a sale, and I don't know if it's going to be the same business model. Kel, did you get any information? There's four adult only uh, in, in right now. It's um, uh, No, Donna might know a little bit more. 
Yeah, Shop Therapy, The Vault, uh, the Northampton Smoke Shop, and uh, uh, Florence Smoke Shop. Thanks, Don and Kelly. All right, what's this section? Redistribution and coupon redemption. Not yeah. good. That is against our regs, as I recall. There's it's no... easier to just use the model regulation than try okay. to merge the ours and the model. So I just crossed out ours entirely, except no person shall, and then used the model regulation there. <clears throat> Fine. Because the coupons has been a slippery slope and what that looks like in stores. And so I think this just kind of um, does a better job at encompassing okay. what we're seeing in the field. Out of package sales. So possess, hold, keep, sell, or distribute, or cause to be distributed. Package that continues fewer than 20 cigarettes. Okay. Refilling cartridges. Is that new language? Did we not have that? The red is new. Yeah. Okay. We've had that. We've had those. Here's our violations. So we're in violation section F, um, or it's T, section T, subsection F. In addition to the monetary fine set above, any permit holder who engages in the sale or distribution of tobacco products to defined herein directly to a consumer while his or her permit is suspended shall constitu uh, con constituent a separate violation of this regulation and may be subject to revocation of the tobacco product sales permit. Permit holder may also be subject to the suspension of all Board of Health issued permits for 30 consecutive days. So, so that is if they have a um, retail food permit as well, we could suspend that. That's what that's saying. Any other permits that we're um, licensing of, suspend them. Questions or comments? <clears throat> The rationale is um, because we can, we will. <laughs> well, so yeah, no, I we used. I actually used this without having our regular having it in the regulation. Um, but I knew we had the authority um, with Racing Mart when I brought the owner and in, into a meeting, a Zoom meeting after Donna went in on the fifth time and saw they were um, secretively selling products, I said it is um, a privilege to have permits with the city of Northampton. It's not just a given. And if you can't abide by, you know, local, state and federal laws, you know, that we're just, we'll, we'll take all of your permits back. We'll suspend them all. Um, so we've used it before, but it's nice having it codified here in the regulation. Yeah. But it's only 30 days. But uh, yeah. That include beer and wine, um, particularly in the Racing Mart situation? We, we're not the um, regulator of that. That would have to be the local license commission or the ABCC. Yep. All right, here's enforcement. I don't know why you four and five are highlighted in yours. They're not in mine. Okay. 
right, and then we change the date. Anything else? So, am I understanding this right, that we're going to make a decision about updating this, these regulations now, and then in the future, possibly look at the tobacco-free generation? So that's, that's uh, something that we talked about last time, thinking that if we did the nicotine free generation proposal, that would mean a lot of hearings and maybe a lot of contention. And um, if we wanted to get on these changes, including the pouches, that might be a quicker, quicker fix. Mm -hmm. um, does that sound, still sound, sound right? Do you want to do that? So, but that means we're still going to be looking at that, just we're going to update these now first and then look at that as a completely separate thing. Is that, do I have that right? I think that was the plan. Does that sound right to everybody? Yeah, we knew we had to do this and, and we have to have a hearing, so that delays it even more. Right. Um, so I think we agreed that... Um, we wanted to, to get this done. Right. Uh, we want to run parallel tracks. I reviewed right. the um the meeting, last month's meeting, and it was the board's decision that we didn't want NFG to hold uh what we are putting it into this draft. So we were gonna bring this draft forward to you today and you would vote if you wanted to move this forward to next month's meeting to hold a hearing to vote on this draft. <clears throat> At the same time, we could start planning out, you know, our public forums for NFG. And with, with the hope of, uh, my concern is, as Cheryl said, we just don't have cessation um, tools and abilities and offerings down. I mean, uh, we're going to have to, not we, but I mean, <laughs> Uh, we we'll have to really relook at um, what's available in terms of cessation for people if we go to nicotine free. That's going to take some time. <clears throat> Youth cessation in particular. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what nicotine free generation is doing, saying like if you are born on or before this date, you're never going to be able to legally buy tobacco or nicotine in Northampton. And we know yeah. that we do have youth addicted to tobacco and nicotine in Northampton. So part of our um, PHE shared service 24, excuse me, fiscal year 25 work plan is actually to assess um, the schools that are in our catchment area, what they have for, well, what they do um, if they, find some, you know, a youth that has tobacco or nicotine on them and what they do for um, education and cessation. So we're actually in assessment phase this year of that with the schools. And I do believe uh, Heather's gone, but she worked for Spiffy before she worked for um, MTCP and they had done prior assessments as well um, in regards to this. And she, I feel like has um, more knowledge about youth cessation and what's available. And I think it's kind of part of their work plan, Lisa, as CPs, um, to be able to help with this. Yeah, I mean, so and Heather's probably like probably one of the most competent CPs in in the in the state, honestly. Um, she's great to work with and she's she's been working in the schools. Like every time I'll be like, oh, there's, you know, are you concerned about cessation with kids? And she's like, oh, I've been working with the schools already for a while. So do so you guys have a great resource there? Um, and she could definitely come and answer more of the questions about like not only what do they offer, but what kind of programs do they have when they find kids with um with tobacco products and, and kind of the whole um, I don't know if, how much she's worked with the schools in your area specifically, but I, she has worked a lot with a lot of schools in that area, in your area, um, to to figure out kind of what's, you know, what's going on and what are the best tools. And and I will say, like, this is one of those things that I think we as a state could be doing better. Kind of my, my own personal point of view is that we could be especially doing youth cessation better. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things. It's one of those areas that. Um, 
uh, so much of the cessation is focused on adult cessation um, and ignores the fact that there are kids that are addicted and that we should be doing more for them. So I, I appreciate that you guys are concerned about that. And I definitely like will bring that to the meetings I have with DPH and other agencies. And, and it's something that we're working on to, to try to, um, to make better, but you guys have a great resource in, in terms of what Heather can do and help you with in, in your area. And such a different tactic with kids too, you know, for cessation. So, yeah. Right. Like it's a, it's a call line. And I was like, I don't know if a call line is the best way to help teenagers. <laughs> Yeah, I'm back when I, I worked um, with the state in tobacco control, the, the problem was there, there was not a lot of evidence-based programs for, for young people that really showed, you know, positive outcomes lasting. I'm, that was a long time ago, so I'm hoping it's changed. I think it's better, date? but it, it depends on the school district, so. Okay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, 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 no worries. I just wondered, should we pin a date uh, when we want this signed? Um, can I just add, I'm sorry, I didn't hear this addressed. Uh, uh, Dallas's name needs to come off at the bottom. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Susie. I would love to have the hearing in November with an effective date of January 1st. That'd be great. That'd give people um, merchants time to sell down their product. Most of this is already the law. <laughs> yeah, the, the yeah. one that affects them is the restriction of the oral nicotine pouches. Right. Yeah, pouches. Mm -hmm. Right. Big one. We'll hear about that at the hearing. So are people feeling uh, ready to vote on this? They're relatively minor changes except for the pouches right correct <clears throat> i move to approve the draft before us second any questions or comments all right all in favor cynthia yes suzanne Yes. Janet? Yes. Joanne? Yes. Okay. We have updated our nicotine sales regulations. Congratulations. <laughs> Every couple of years. <laughs> I always have such a sense of accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Thank you. I just want to say thank you to Lisa for coming tonight. We appreciate your help and it's nice having the board meet you. Um, Cheryl's always been um, the one at our meetings. So this was great. I work with Lisa a lot. So it's nice having you on the team. Thank you for Thank having you. me. I'm, I'm happy to help. Yeah, it's great to have you as a, as a resource. Um, okay, so uh, Meredith, did you have some updates? Um, you know, I, I don't. <laughs> what you been doing? <laughs> I'm not about that. I'm so sorry. Ask me some questions. I'm good off the cuff. Cynthia, go. Is there any update on, and maybe there was, the opioid money survey? Oh, yes. Good question. So um, we have Taylor... Um, Nikki Andrew, who was our Hampshire Hope coordinator, then got promoted to the um, Substance Use Prevention Director, has been playing both roles, still coordinating Hampshire Hope, um, worked with a couple um, people from the Executive Committee to create a survey based off the AG guidelines, asking the questions on how asking questions to the people who are impacted and the general public, how they'd like to see this money spent. So we have received 480 responses in Hampshire County, which seems low. However, when you compare it to all of Boston that's received 120 responses, we've done really good. So um, we're in the process of working with our tech team, Molly specifically, 
um, because uh, getting that information in Qualtrics and analyzing the data. Um, Taylor can tell you from just the brief assessment, kind of the top two buckets on um, how, how the surveys came back on how people feel it should be spent. And one of them being harm reduction services, more available and supportive housing, um, housing first kind of initiative. So with that being said, um, Taylor and I just recently, there has been a rise um, matching grant. And I don't want to call it a grant because it's not a grant. It's just a match from the state um, saying, you know, if you spend you can spend up to $50,000 of your own resettlement money and the state will match it as long as it's a good initiative that falls within the AG guidelines and also falls um, from the voices of the community that you surveyed. So we're looking to do two applications, one with our PHE collaborative, which is 14 communities. And we're not asking money from all of our communities because some communities like our, our more rural communities are only getting $500 or $1,000. We're asking East Hampton, Northampton, and Amherst all to pitch in $50,000 each, which is 150,000 and the state will match it if they approve our application. And so we'll have 300,000 for this for one year to spend, which we will give to Tapestry as our partnering organization to provide harm reduction services not just to these three communities that are pitching in, but to all 14 communities. Our Hilltown um, communities really, you know, don't have access to these types of services. So this is a huge movement in providing harm reduction tools and services to other communities that don't naturally get them, while also subsidizing what we get here in, you know, East Hampton, North Hampton, um, and Amherst and everything in between. So um, we're very, very excited about that and hoping that we do get approved. In addition to um, expanding the harm reduction services, they're also, because Housing First was also part of the initiative and we are in a housing crisis, we're not having our shelter, you know, capacity increased anytime soon or affordable housing. We're looking to partner with Craig's Doors and or CHD to give them money to support um, emergency situation vouchers for, you know, hotel rooms and that kind of sort. Can you just list examples of the harm reduction services? So um, expanding their mobile unit, you know, going from community to community with um, clean needles, with um, uh, testing strips, fentanyl testing strips, um, um, help me here, wound care kits, education. Narcan. Narcan, thank you. <laughs> Nothing on safe injection sites. Um, so we're really, I mean, we have written multiple later letters to our senators, our state reps, to the governor. We're hoping that gets passed. Um, you know, we've got the will um, from city council, from the board of health, from the mayor, from Northampton Police Department um, to move forward with, you know, looking at it here in Northampton, but until it's passed through legislation, I don't see a way we could do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. But this that's, is uh, this is such, mm -hmm. it's such a win-win what you just described, though, Meredith, with uh, the collaboratives and the region and mm -hmm. the matching. That's what you're really good at. So yeah, that's great. Yeah. So we're going to put in two applications, one with the region, and then we're going to put in a Northampton application as well. So that'll be another 50,000 that the state will match 50,000. So that'll be 100,000 that just goes towards Northampton. And we're going to work with um, MANA and CHD because CHD has the quality in. Um, and if we can get them funding, they could possibly get more rooms where we could, you know, through the DCC, get emergency shelter on, you know, cold days, cold evening, uh, cold nights. 
the legislature ever get around to making fentanyl dipsticks legal? I do believe so, yes. Okay. I I, I lost it somewhere that the Senate was working on it, but I wasn't sure that if it made it out through the legislative session. You know, it had to have because you can get them on the mass clearinghouse for free. There you go. Yeah, so. But it was crazy, crazy illegal there for a long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, shoot another question. I'm ready. Uh, I'm just wondering it's if late. there's an update on the shield law. Oh, great. That's coming next month, Janet. I met with um, Councilor Mayori, Councilor Clemmer, Alan Seawald, the mayor, um, mm -hmm. last Friday, and um, talking about moving it forward. So Councilor Mayori is going to come and update you all then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Anybody? Um, I I'm just had a quick um, I'm with the Daily Hampshire Gazette. I'm sorry. Uh, we're Can in the hear? board meeting. You're. I'm sorry. We're not allowed to uh, have a conversation. We shouldn't be allowed to be unmuted. Um. Uh, anybody else? Um, Updates, questions, comments. Our uh, next, oh, uh, and Meredith is about um, our empty board position. That was the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the mayor knows about it. Hopefully we get some applicants. We've got a lot of open seats on committees and commissions in the city. So I know they're working hard to fill them. I propose that our um, Board of Health and the um, Human's Right Commission join forces. I think there's a lot of work that we could do together. <laughs> Agreed. Yeah? Is this something that we could talk about maybe in the future? Meaning we would be one and the same? Or we would just work work together? Well, now that there is a um, Department of Health and Human Services, we don't have to have a Board of Health. Um, yeah. What? what do you mean? I, We're extinct? What do you mean? I, well, I didn't extinct you. I, not clearly. <laughs> I love having the power of the Board of Health here. Um, um, I don't know what it looks like. I just think what a great um, marriage the two commissions and and our board would be. Aren't there two different functions? The board is a civilian group and the department are city employees. For our, for us? Well, yeah, and, and throughout the Commonwealth. It, with the exception of health and human services, right? You, if we, health and human services could have an advisory board, not a board of health if they wanted to. But then we wouldn't, uh, the state gives the Board of Health powers. Right, but they give health commissioners the same powers as long as they have an advisory board. Yeah, it's a, the language is just a little different. Sounds like we could have a conversation about this. Oh, and I love my Board of Health. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wasn't even a question when it was brought up to me. <laughs> Uh, okay, our next meeting is the third Thursday is November 21st. So we're going to have a hearing prior to our board meeting. Is that how we've done it before? One more time. We're going to have a hearing um, for the new regs prior to the official board meeting. Mm -hmm. And then just to let you know, the um October, the December 19th meeting, I will not be here. And that's when <clears throat> Racing Mart will be back. But I think you have enough information and I'll make sure that you have some TA from Lisa or Cheryl. Yeah, can I have can we have Lisa or Cheryl be present? Mm -hmm. We can't move it to the next week. That's even worse. Mm -hmm. <clears throat>
Um, what would the hearing start at five thirty, our usual time? For November. For November, yeah. Well, we would. Um, no, we would. I think we would have a lot of public comment, so we'd probably put the hearing. I I wouldn't put a time on the hearing, um, just because I we never know how much public comment we're going to get. The start time, though, that's the question. Oh, the start time of the meeting. Yeah, yeah five thirty. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. yeah, the hearing. Yeah, I, I I'm confused. Is the hearing on a different date than our board of health meeting or not? No, yeah. we will start with a hearing. And then we'll officially open the Board of Health meeting when that's done, right? And it, uh, we've discussed this in the past. If there's a lot of comment, is there a certain uh, time that we can cut, lit off, um, cut off comments? We've discussed this once before. We just keep going. I don't think we, when we were having that um decision we didn't limit time as i recall I, I think it's a good idea to do it but we chose not to we limit how long any one person can speak and i think that's okay. really important that we do that right yeah and we, would we want to for public comment before a meeting we usually do two minutes but do we want to go longer or shorter for a um hearing and the hearing is uh, where we can have discussion, back and forth discussion, or is that only at a forum? It's at a forum. Okay. So hearing is really like extended public comment? I think it's on one topic mm -hmm. and one issue. I think mm -hmm. nothing way. else. Is, yeah, I don't know. I, I think the usual two minutes should be adequate. I'm speaker has timekeeper has spoken. <laughs> no, I just um, I, there aren't dramatic changes in these regulations, and most of them are either required or recommended. Um, so I I don't know why someone would need longer than that to to make a a point or two about the proposals. Okay. And then the only other question is, I mean, do we want to do a hybrid version? Meaning? Meaning meet in person and allow online or just stick to the online? Do you think um, access is an issue if we're just online? People are used to these meetings by now. Okay. I, I, mean, I, I recognize everyone does not have the capability. Um, we've conducted a lot of business for years now using this. For this time, I think there's not going to be a whole lot of discussion. Right. Um, but when we talk about the nicotine free generation, I think we would have multiple sites, multiple forums, multiple ways, and maybe then. Right would be interested in an in-person venue. Right. Other thoughts? All right, would someone like to make a motion? Um, to adjourn the meeting. meeting. To adjourn. <laughs> I second. Yeah. All right, thank you board for all the good work. Thank you. And we'll clean this up and we'll get it back to you in the next couple of weeks. All in favor of adjourning. Oh. Thanks. That's everybody. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.